Thank you for joining us for another episode of Boom and Bust. I'm your host, Tony Clement. I'm here at the News Forum, where all voices matter. As a former parliamentary budget officer for Canada, Kevin Page has a deep and unique perspective on the country's fiscal challenges. Post-election, it's now a good time to review the nation's debt and taxation situation and what's up ahead. Kevin Page now serves as the head of the Institute for Fiscal Studies and Democracy at the University of Ottawa. Welcome back to the program, Kevin. Good to be with you, Tony. Great to have you. Well, uh, I'd love to get your initial thoughts on, just to start off with at least, how you saw fiscal issues uh, about debt and deficit and taxation, how they were treated during the election campaign. Yeah, I don't. It was, they were not a front and center issue, like the issue of deficits and debt, uh, which is a little surprising given just how dramatic the increases were in deficits and debt in 2020 and 21. But I, I think it's yeah. I think the the bigger issues were you know obviously and there were a wide range of issues from uh, from childcare to housing to First Nations issues, uh, climate change obviously. Uh, but fiscally, yeah, it was a second order issue. It showed up later in the campaign when people, when the parties started to table their their fiscal plans, their costed fiscal plans. Now, that must have been uh, obviously something that you had called for when you were a parliamentary budget officer, that these uh, campaign promises be assessed uh, by the office uh, of the parliamentary budget officer. And we did see that happen. Um, what, what's your sense of, of how that worked? Did it work out well? Yeah, so I think, like Tony, I think it worked out well in 2019 when we had like a fixed state election, and there was enough time for all the political parties to to work with the Parliamentary Budget Office to get their proposals costed and to get comfortable with those baselines. It was obviously a different type of election this time around. Uh, it was a snap election. There wasn't as much time for the parties to work with the PBO, so we didn't see as many measures costed. Um, but, you know, they're still on the positive side. Um, all the major party platforms were, were based on similar economic and fiscal assumptions with respect to the, you know, the economy and deficits and debt. And many of the initiatives were costed and, and they're now on the Parliamentary Budget Office's website. So it's, it's still, I think we're still, it's a net positive. That, that's actually a good point, Kevin. Uh, maybe our viewers aren't aware of it, but there's a there's a give and take. There's a there's a dialogue with the office of the parliamentary budget officer uh, before the numbers are publicly assessed and, and and that is published, right? Correct. Yeah, and it's um, yeah, and in, there's a lot of initiatives. Like if you kind of if we run through the various party platforms, like there's you know in many cases you know the um, you know there's dozens upon dozens of initiatives in each party platform that needed to be costed. And uh, yeah, so it takes time to do this sort of work. Uh, there, you know, usually involves some modeling, some work with Statistics Canada on data, you know, some back and forth on the assumptions, making sure that the Parliamentary Budget Office officer understands the parameters. So yeah, it, it, t it takes weeks, not months, but certainly weeks to do this sort of costing. And then a sit down with the party officials to make sure that they're comfortable with these numbers as well. Uh, obviously, the, the Liberals are uh, back in power. They they have a minority uh, government. How do you assess their uh, specific election promises when it comes to the fiscal front? Yeah, so we developed a, a methodology. Actually, the methodology was really was developed by one of my former bosses at the Department of Finance, Scott Clark. We it really talk. We talk about fiscal credibility, and we look at it, Tony, I think through three lenses. One, we we just we look at the assumptions. Uh, two, we look at the issue of uh, the medium term, you know, fiscal plan. Is it fiscally responsible? And and three, actually, we look at the transparency. So I mean, overall, like all the you know the three major parties that had costed fiscal platforms, they all received at least a pass. Liberals got a good grade in part because um, you know we saw that you know their platform would be fiscally sustainable over the long term. We could talk about that. And also, like they had uh, some medium term targets with respect to declining budgetary balances and a declining debt to GDP ratio, which we think is important for a defensible medium term plan. We're speaking with Kevin Page. He's the head of the Institute of Fiscal Studies and Democracy at the University of Ottawa, of course, a former parliamentary budget officer. We've got lots to discuss. Please stay with us for the next segments. We'll be right back.
Welcome back to Boom and Bust. I'm your host, Tony Clement, here with Kevin Page. He is the head of the Institute of Fiscal Studies and Democracy at the University of Ottawa, former parliamentary budget officer, talking, we're talking deficits, debt, taxation, you name it. Kevin, uh, I guess I'm going on a little bit of my experience as well as your experience here, but my experience with minority governments, minority parliaments, is they tend to be expensive. Uh, the parties tend to throw monies, uh, money at problems uh, and use cash to reach agreements with opposition parties to get their, their legislation through the parliament. Is this your assessment as well? It's certainly my concern, like um, Tony, that, um, and I think it really starts when we just like looking at the various party platforms, we've all seen all parties are proposing increases in deficits over the, the baseline forecast provided by the parliamentary budget officers. So they're all talking about increases in deficits over the medium term. And I think, yeah, when it comes down to the, 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 the proverbial horse trading and making sure that we get these financial bills, I think through parliament that um, you know, I, I think the pressure, the bias will definitely be towards deficits. Uh, so it is a concern. I think the only way we can counteract it, Tony, is with a strong uh, fiscal planning framework, like you know, the one we had, I think, with, with your government, Tony, with a really hard commitment to get back to budgetary balance over, uh, over the, the medium term. But without a strong fiscal anchor or fiscal target, it's, I think, yeah, the deficit bias will, will show its way through. I do want to talk to you about strategic reviews uh, a little bit later on. I think that's a really important topic. But before we get to that, I, I, again, maybe just a primer for our viewers on what the role of Parliament is and or should be when it comes to fiscal accountability. What, how would you describe that to our viewers? Yeah, so I think it's we want governments that you know to to be able to propose legislation. Yeah, you know, I think it's you know we have elections. Uh, governments are given, uh, political parties you know, become formed governments, they're given mandates, and you want to move that through. We'll see a speech from the throne probably just in, probably within the month that will highlight the, the major priorities for the 44th session of parliament. But yeah, I think the role of, of, of parliament in general is to scrutinize um, you know, the strategy, to scrutinize the spending bills, to scrutinize the tax legislation that's essential to move forward on those, you know, those priorities. And um, yeah, it's it's a key element it's our, of our accountability system. Uh, I mean, it's a good system. We get budgets passed. You know, as we kind of watch American news these days, they 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 are struggling to get a budget bill passed, and they're struggling over something called a debt limit. So we tend, you know, to get these things passed, and I, I think we want to continue that practice. And really, there's a big role for it's not just uh, sort of set votes uh, in the uh, House of Commons itself, but it's also parliamentary committee oversight function, right? Yeah, so I mean, there'll be on when we finally see a budget bill, and it, it could be that we'll see a fall update in a few months, which will probably look like a budget because there's a lot of initiatives, short term initiatives that were highlighted in the liberal platform. Um, yeah, and you know, around a budget, there tends to be a, like, at least a discussion around, um, you know, the the strategy, but I think as, as we kind of move into the the supply system like the supply of authorities this will get down to committees committees will review the you know the you know the requested votes you're a former president of the treasury board nobody knows this better than you uh yeah we want those you know parliamentary committees those standing committees for different departments to approve those estimates yeah and, and again the, the the procedures if there's fundamental changes to tax laws um you know and we're changing tax code you know those will be debated in, in uh, through various forms of legislative review for second third readings etc and is that where the horse trading takes place as well? Uh, it's kind of, I guess it's kind of both behind the scenes, but also uh, as these uh, bills wend their way through the system, right? Yeah, I think I, I would assume, Tony, like the, a lot of the horse trading will take place, um, you know, as the budgets are being developed, uh, you know, there'll be an opportunity for the prime minister, finance minister of the day to sit down with, with leaders of other parties. Um, I remember your party doing it with Mr. Layton back in the day on, on just to make sure that, you know, minority parliament scenario that Prime Minister Harper was going to get his budgets passed. And um, so, yeah, there's definitely horse trading at the front end. I think it's a bit dangerous to do significant horse trading while the bills are in front of parliament. There could definitely be changes. Um, but you, can, you don't want those changes to kind of create a, a vote of confidence, which could mean that we could find ourselves literally back into an election sooner rather than later. Um, if the government loses the confidence of parliament over a financial bill. That's uh, actually a very good point uh, because uh, ultimately 
Um, I would say all of the political parties, or most of them, probably don't want to go to the polls. They don't want to trigger an election. So while there is some grandstanding and uh, games of chicken, at the end of the day, they'll find a way to uh, find a solution. We're going to return with Kevin Page, uh, head of the Institute of Fiscal Studies and Democracy, University of Ottawa, right after these messages. Stay with us. And we're back here at Boom and Bust. Uh, thanks for joining us again. We're here with Kevin Page. He's uh, head of the Institute of Fiscal Studies and Democracy, University of Ottawa, former parliamentary budget officer. Kevin, uh, I want to talk to you about the Liberal plan for a strategic review. What, what exactly is that and what does it entail? Yeah, Tony, we don't have a lot of details. Uh, there were really just a few lines of it in the the uh, in the Liberal platform, the costed part of the Liberal platform, where they you know committed to talk about at least a policy review. Um, and so you know, we've you know we have experience in Canada with different types of reviews. Uh, certainly, like the most famous probably is the program review in the 1990s, which was definitely focused on fiscal consolidation. I think this there's an opportunity with the Liberals to kind of look a little bit with maybe with some focus on fiscal consolidation, but also really to look like in the context of their agenda, do we have government policies in place like to deal with net zero economy? Like are all the policies like firing in all cylinders in order to get to a more inclusive economy? Uh, are we ready for the next pandemic or the next economic shock in terms of resiliency? So, and, and you know, and there's an opportunity to look at the policies and the spending that goes behind it. But we don't have any targets or really parameters around that. And it's, it, I'm hoping that we see that early rather than later uh, from the government with respect to a, a budget update. Yeah. So uh, they can. It's basically, uh, from what you're saying, an opportunity for some structural reforms. So. There, there would be a program review of government programs. You have some, uh, obviously, some things that you want to accomplish, whether they're environmental goals or uh, social equity goals or, or reconciliation goals, just to name three. So there's there's some policy initiatives, but they can lead to structural reforms. Is that what you're is that what you're thinking? Yeah, we're hoping that you know that 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 will be the emphasis of this policy review, as opposed to some of the you know, more traditional spending reviews that had a strong fiscal consolidation focus. Um, you know, a lot of these initiatives, um, you know, health or First Nations, as you've identified, climate change, they cut across many departments. So to review it in a very cohesive way, uh, you're looking at all departments, they, those po policy objectives. We think like that would probably that would be a good practice. Uh, those more horizontal policy reviews. I think invol involving parliamentary committees, maybe experts from outside of government as well would be a good practice. Okay. Uh, and uh, are there things that can be learned from previous strategic reviews? You, you mentioned that in passing, that we've had these before from the 1990s on. Are there some good lessons to be learned from those? Yeah, I think there are lessons. Like we've um, I, just even in my lifetime, Tony, I started a Department of Finance early 1980s uh, under progressive conservative government. We had a deputy prime minister leader review, um, the Nielsen reviews. Um, yeah, I, I lived through those 1990 program reviews. Um, I think your government, you know, when you were president of the Treasury Board, launched you know kind of a more of a systemic kind of like a certain percentage of spending base being reviewed each year. So. Yeah, I think like you know, the good practice. Obviously, we want buy-in from political leaders, from all the cabinet ministers. It's it's very difficult for public servants and other experts to kind of put proposals together if the government's not really committed. Um, I think like having a good information base behind these programs. How are they performing? Like being truly honest about performance. Are they effective? Are they efficient programs? Um, you know, I think in, in I think consulting with uh, citizens while we're doing these reviews to make sure that these programs they can be transfers, grants, and contributions to people like they're delivering the services that Canadians want. So yeah, there's a lot of review. You know, there's some best practices, and you know, these are actually compiled by the OECD uh, for for you know for OECD countries. So yeah, I think the government will be well positioned to kind of learn from those those past experiences. Are there any sort of downsides and risks when they're doing this kind of review of government programs? Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, I think it's, I mean, you could run a, a poor review. Um, you could have, um, you could fall far short of your targets if they're fiscal targets or if you have policy objectives and it, it's clear that the government is really not making the kind of structural changes you know, that, that they need to. 
Um, and I think in that sense, it could undermine the confidence of the government. So yeah, and it's, I think when you're dealing with multiple departments, multiple ministers, like you're involving parliament potentially in the exercise, if, if only through the spending appropriation side, that um, yeah, there's definitely this downside risk. So these are the kinds of things they've got to have to balance then, right? Yeah, it's definitely a balancing act. We're going to continue our discussion with Kevin Page. Uh, he's the head of the Institute of uh, Fiscal Studies and Democracy, University of Ottawa, former parliamentary budget officer. As we uh, dust ourselves off from the federal election campaign, it's, uh, it's our opportunity to look ahead and uh, see what's on the near horizon. So please uh, stay with us. We'll be back with our final uh, portion of this episode. Welcome back to Boom and Bust. I'm your host, as always, uh, Tony Clement, here with Kevin Page, formerly Parliamentary Budget Officer, now with the IFSD at the University of Ottawa. Kevin, I want to broaden this out a little bit. Uh, we've been focused on the Canadian election, uh, some of the immediate impacts that could be there, but there's also the broader context, and uh, I, I, know, I know you're aware of these as well. I want to, by that I mean there are events and uh, risks that are geopolitical, that are worldwide, and they could have an impact on Canada's ability to weather these storms. So uh, I understand that there was a, uh, there's a new kind of international fiscal updates like the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development. Maybe go into that a little bit for our viewers. I think they'd find that interesting. Yeah, so we have, we've seen and we've got an interim update from the OECD. Uh, on, on basically, you know, where they think the economy is headed. It's a little bit um, more pessimistic than they released just a few months ago. Uh, it's really not surprising that there'd be some volatility in these numbers simply because, we, you know, the pandemic continues. But it, it is a less rosy outlook for the, for the global economy, for G20 economies, and for Canada. So they've kind of marked down, you know, Canada growth, certainly in 2021. Um, and, and, you know, in the United States as well. So, I mean, this could mean that as the government takes office and it releases its, you know, its fiscal update, probably in, in the month of November, that they'll start with the baseline assumptions for, for growth, for deficits and debt. That's a little, you know, a, a little bit less rosy than it was uh, even just for the platform. Um, you know, I think like some of these issues that are highlighted by the OECD certainly includes like inflation. Uh, inflation is is running quite high, actually. Yes, the August numbers for Canada were four point one percent inflationary rate, so that's uh, quite high. Yeah, we have high numbers in Canada, and particularly the U.S. and the U.K. Tony, that I think are that are certainly going to uh, make it, you know, or, or create some troubles for central bankers and how to manage the tapering that goes on with respect to monetary policy, the the forward guidance that needs to be there with respect to raising interest rates over this period of time. Um, yeah, it'll have a bite as well on consumers, you know, because they're, you know, they're paying higher prices for some key, you know, for things like shelter and for transportation as well. Um, so, yeah, there's like definitely the, that is uh, a concern. I think there's a lot of concern about this Delta variant. It's more transmissible. Um, and, uh, you know, it's I think it's having a dampening impact on some of the economies that are less vaccinated. But also even within our own country, Tony, it's not a you know, we're seeing high infection rates in some of our Western provinces as well, which is very concerning. And so, yeah, again, these are shocks. If you go back um, to 2019, when we were having, we found ourselves in election mode, we look at the platforms, it was pretty much, a lot of it was about affordability. And then we found our, the government really confronted with a, a global pandemic. So, I mean, we have to be prepared that, you know, that there's things that we just, we, you know, these unknown unknowns that we just can't predict and governments are gonna have to respond quickly. Yeah, no, I, I think those are all interesting points. Um, uh, generally, then, I guess part of the problem for planning is we're not really out of COVID yet. Uh, we we don't know whether there are continued risks with COVID, and, and yet we still have to do, or the government still has to do planning uh, on the basis that there there are infl there are inflationary risks and other things as the economy emerges out of COVID. Is that right? Yeah, I think that's correct. And whether you're a federal finance minister or a provincial one, that you're dealing still in those sort of three three lanes. You know, the pandemic, as you've alluded to, the recovery, 
I think the Canadian economy is, is still operating below output and employment levels uh, of February 2020 when this when COVID hit us. And you're trying to figure out how to position the Canadian economy in a post-COVID world, how to you know get to net zero, how to boost productivity, um, you know how to create a more inclusive economy. So it's still it's still we're still in that environment. It hasn't fundamentally changed in terms of the challenges that we're facing, even when the Liberals are trying to prepare their their, their budget for 2021. We're, we're still dealing with three tracks. Hi, Kevin Page. It's been uh, great to have you on our program. We very much appreciate uh, your interest in what's going on with our country, and we'll be following it as you will be in the future as well. Thanks again for joining our program. An honor to be with you, Tony. Some uh, very interesting words of wisdom there from Kevin Page, a former parliamentary budget officer, obviously, about the, the sort of the fiscal situation We've got another minority uh, liberal government uh, in Canada, but they've got uh, real issues that they've got to address, not only because of what's happening in Canada, but what's happening around the world as well. And of course, COVID is still with us. So lots to take in there. Thanks for watching. We'll be covering the stories as usual.